everybody we are starting a new book it's called a long way from chicago and it is by richard peck prologue page one whoops that's a little close there we go i was it was always august when you spent a week with our grandmother i was joey then not joe joey dowdle and my sister was mary alice in our first visits, we were still just kids, so we hardly see her town because of Grandma. She was so big, and the town was so small. She was old, too, or so we thought, as old as the hills, and tough. She was as tough as an old boot, or so we thought. As the years went by, though, Mary Alice and I grew up. And though Grandma never changed, we seemed to see a different woman every summer. Now I'm older than Grandma was then, quite a bit older. But as the time gets past me, I seem to remember more and more about those hot summer days and nights and the last house in town where Grandma lived. And Grandma, are all of my memories true? Every word and growing truer with the years. Chapter One, Shotgun Cheatham's Last Night Above the Ground. 1929, page three. You wouldn't think we'd have to leave Chicago to see a dead body. We were growing up back then in the bad old days of Al Capone's and Bugs Morin. Just the winter before, they'd seen the St. Valentine's Day Massacre over on North Clark Street. The city had such an evil reputation that the Thornton submachine gun was better known as the Chicago typewriter. But I'd grown to the age of nine and my sister Mary Alice was seven and we'd yet to see a stiff. We guessed that most of them were where you couldn't see them, at the horizon of, at the bottom of Lake Michigan, wearing concrete overshoes. No, we had to travel all the way down to our Grandma Dowdles before we ever set eyes on a corpse. Dad said Mary Alice and I were getting to the age that we could travel on our own. He said it was time we spent a week with Grandma, who was getting on in years. We hadn't seen anything of her since we were tykes. Being Chicago people, mother and daddy didn't have a car and grandma wasn't on the telephone. They're dumping us on her is what they're doing, Mary Alice said darkly. She suspected that mother and dad would take off for a week of fishing up in Wisconsin in our absence. I didn't mind going because we went on the train. The, Wash, the Wabash Railroad Crack Bluebird that left Dearborn Station every morning bound for St. Louis. Grandma lived somewhere in between, in one of those towns the railroad tracks cut in two. People stood out on their porches to see the train go through. Mary Alice said she couldn't stand the place. For one thing, at Grandma's she had to go outside to the privy. It stood just across from the Cobb House, the Cobb House, a rumble down shed full of stuff left there in Grandpa Dowdle's time, a big old snaggle tooth tomcat lived in the cop house. And as quick as you'd come out of the privy, he'd jump at you. And Mary Alice hated that. Mary Alice said there was nothing to do and nobody to do it with. And so she'd tag after me, though I was two years older and a boy. We'd stroll uptown in those first few days. It was only a short block of brick buildings. The bank, the insurance agency, Moore's store, and the coffee pot cafe where the old saloon had stood. Prohibition was on, it, on in those days, which meant that selling liquor was against the law. So people made their own beer at home. They still had the tin roofs out over the sidewalk and hitching rails. Most farmers came to town in horse drawn, though there were Fords and the banker L.J. Windelbach drove a Hupmobile. It looked like it was a slow place to us, but that was before they buried Shotgun Cheatham. He might have made it unnoticed all the way to the grave, except for his name. The county seat newspaper didn't run an obituary on anybody called Shotgun, but nobody knew any other name for that. This sparked attention from some of the bigger newspapers. One sent in a stinger to nose around the, co the coffee pot cafe 
for a human interest story since it was August, a slow month for news. The coffee pot was where people went to loaf, to talk, and to tell and swap gossip. Mary Alice and I were some of the in were some of the interest when we dropped by because we were kin of Mrs. Daldos, who never set foot in the place. She said she liked to keep herself to herself, which was uphill work in a town like that. Mary Alice and I carried the tale home that a suspicious type had come off the train in citified clothes and a stiff straw hat. He stuck out a mile and was asking around about shotgun Cheatham, and he was taking notes. Grandma had already heard it on the grapevine that shotgun was no more, though she wasn't the first person people ran to with the news. She wasn't what you'd call a popular woman. Grandpa Daldo had been well thought of, but he was long gone. And that was the day when working, when, wait, that was the day she was working tomatoes on the Black Iron Range and her kitchen was hot enough to steam the calendars off the wall. Her sleeves were turned back on her big arm. When she heard the town was apt to fill up with newspaper reporters, her jaw clenched. Frequently, presently, she said, I'll tell you what, that reporter's after. He wants to get the horse laugh on us because he thinks we're nothing but a bunch of hayseeds and no-count country people. We are, but what business is it of his? Who was shotgun Cheatham anyway, Mary Alice asked. He was just an old reprobate who lived poor and die broke, what Grandma said. Nobody went near him because he smelled like a polecat. He lived in a chicken coop, and now they'll have to burn it down. To change the subject, she said to me, Here, you stir these tomatoes and don't let them stick. I've stood in this heat till I'm half cooked myself. I didn't like kitchen work. Yesterday she'd done apple butter, and that hadn't been too bad. She made that outdoors over an open fire, and she'd put pennies in the cauldron to keep it from sticking. Down at the coffee pot, they say shotgun road with the James boys. Which James boys, Grandma said. Jesse James, I said, and Frank. They wouldn't have had him, she said. Anyhow, the them Jameses was Missouri people. They were telling the reporter shotgun killed a man and he went to the penitentiary. Several around here done that, Grandma said. Though I don't recall him being out any town any length of time. Who's doing all that talking? A real old humped over lady with buck teeth, Mary said. Cross eyes, Grandma asked. That'd be Effie Wilcox. You think she's ugly now? She should have seen her as a girl. And she'd talk you to death. Her tongue attached to the middle and flaps at both ends. Grandma was over by the screen door for a breath of air. They say he's notched a gun in six places, I said, pushing my luck. They said the notches were either for banks he dropped or for sheriffs he shot. Was that Effie again? Never trust an ugly woman. She's got a grudge against the world, said Grandma, who was no ill painting herself. She fetched up a sigh. I'll tell you how Shotgun got his name. He wasn't but 10 years old, and he wanted to go out and shoot quail with a bunch of old boys. He couldn't hit a barn wall from the inside, and he had a sty in one eye. They were out there in a pasture without a quail in sight, but Shotgun got all excited being around them big boys. He squeezed off around and killed a cow. Down she went. If he'd been aiming at her, she'd have died of old age eventually. The boys took the gun off him, not knowing who he'd plug next. <coughs> Excuse me. That's how he got his name, and it stuck to him like flypaper. Any girl in town could have outshot him, and that includes me, Grandma jerked a thumb at herself. She, she kept a 12-gauge, double-barreled Winchester Model 21 behind the wood box, but we figured it had been Grandpa Dowell's for shooting ducks. And I wasn't no Annie Oakley myself, except with the squirrels. Grandma was still at the door, fanning her apron. Then, in the same voice, she says, looks like we got company. Take them tomatoes off the fire. A stranger was on the porch. And when Mary Alice and I crowded up behind Grandma to see, it was the reporter. He was sharp-faced and he'd sweated through his hat band. What's your business, Grandma said through the screen, which was as friendly as she got. Ma'am, I'm making inquiries about the late shotgun Cheatham. He shuffled his feet, wanting to get one of them in the door. And then he mopped up under his hat brim with a silk handkerchief. His Masonic ring had diamond chips in it. Who sent you to me? I'm going door to door, ma'am. You know how do ladies love to talk. 
Bless your hearts. You'd all talk the hind leg off a mule. Mary Alice and I both stared at that. We figured Grandma might grab up her brooms and swat them off the porch. We'd already seen how she could make short work of peddlers, even when they weren't very lippy. And tramps didn't seem to mark her, her fence post. We suspected that you didn't get inside her house, even if she knew you. But to our surprise, she swept open the screen door and stepped out onto the porch. I followed, and so did Mary Alice. Once she was sure the snaggle-footed Tom wasn't lurking around there, waiting to pounce. You're a newspaper reporter, she said. Peoria? It was the flashy clothes, but he looked surprised. What they been telling you? Looks like I got a good story by the tail, he said. Last of the old owl hoot gunslingers goes to a pauper's grave. That's kind of the angle, ma'am. I wondered if you could help me flesh out the sordid story. Well, I got some flesh to spare, Grandma said mildly. Who's been talking to you? It was mainly an elderly lady. Ugly as sin calls herself Wilcock, Grandma said. She's been in the state hospital for the insane until just here lately. But as a reporter, I guess you probably knows that out. Mary Alice nudged me hard and the reporter's eyes widened. They tell you how shotgun come by his name? Oh, opinions seem to vary, ma'am. Ah, well, famous fleeting, Grandma said. He got it in the Civil War. <clears throat> the reporter's hand hovered over his breast pocket where a notepad stuck out. Oh, yes, yeah, shotgun went right through the war with an Illinois volunteers. Shiloh, in the spring of 62, he was with the U.S. Grant when you, he was with Ulysses S. Grant when Vittsburg fell. That's where he got his name. Grant gave it to him. In fact, Shotgun didn't hold the government issue firearms. He shot rebels with his old Remington pump action that he used to kill quail back when he was at home. Now Mary Alice was yanking at my shirt tail. We knew kids lied all the time, but Grandma was no kid and she could tell some whoppers. Of course, the reporter had been lied to big time up at the cafe, but Grandma's lies were more interesting, even historical. That made Shotgun look better while he left Effie Wilcox in the dusk. He always was a crack shot, she said, winding down. Come home from the war with a line of medals bigger than his chest. And yet he died penniless, the reporter said in a thoughtful voice. Oh, well, he sold them off the medals and gave money to the war orphans and widows. A change crossed the reporter's narrow face. Shotgun had gone from kill crazy gunslinger to war hero marksman. Philanthropist, even. He fumbled his notepad out and was scribbling. He thought he'd hit pay dirt with grandma. It's all a matter of record, she said. You could look it up. He was ready to wire in a new story. Civil War hero, handpicked by Ulysses S. Grant, called to the great campground in the sky. Something like that. And he never married? Never did, Grandma said. He broke Effie Wilcox's heart. She's bitter still, as you can see. And now he goes to a pauper's grave with none to mark his passing, the reporter said, which may have been a sample of his writing style. They tell you that, Grandma said. They're pulling your legs, honey. You drop by the coffee pot and tell them you heard that shotgun's being buried from my house with full honors. He spent his last night above ground in my front room, and you're invited. The reporter backed down the porch stairs, staggering under all of the new material. Ah, oh, much obliged, ma'am, he said. Happy to help, Grandma said. Mary Alice had turned loose of my shirt tail. What little we knew about grown-ups didn't seem to cover Grandma. She turned on us. Now I've got to change my shoes and walk all the way up to the lumber yard in this heat, she said, as if she hadn't brought it all on herself. Up at the lumber yard, they'd been knocking together shotgun Cheatham's coffin and sending the bill to the county, and Grandma had to tell them to bring that coffin to her house with shotgun in it. By nightfall, a green pine coffin stood on two sawhorses in the little bay window in the front room, and people milled inside the yard. They couldn't see shotgun from there because the coffin lid blocked the view. Besides, a heavy gauze hung from the open lid and down over the front of the coffin to veil him. Shotgun hadn't been exactly fresh when they discovered his body. Grandma had flung open every window, but there was a peculiar smell in the room. I only had one look at him when they carried in the coffin, and that was enough. 
I'll tell you just two things about him. He didn't have his teeth in, and he was wearing bib overalls. The people in the yard still couldn't believe Grandma was holding open house. They didn't stop, that didn't stop the reporter who was haunting the parlor looking for more flesh to add to his story. And it didn't stop Mrs. L. J. Witterbach, the banker's wife, who came leading her father, an ancient codger, half her size in full Civil War Union blue. We are here to pay our respects at this sad time, Miss Swedenbach said when Grandma let them in. When I told Daddy that Shatgun had been decorated by U.S. Grant and was wounded three times at Bull Run, it brought it all back to him and we had to come. Her old daddy wore a forage cap and a decoration from the Grand Army of the Republic, and he seemed to have no idea where he was. She led him up to the coffin, a pitcher of glads from her garden at either side of the pine box. Oh, I'm sorry, to the coffin where they admired the flowers. Grandma had planted a pitcher of glads from her garden at either side of the pine box. In each pitcher, she'd stuck an American flag. A few more people willing to brave Grandma came and went. But finally, we were down to the reporter, who settled in his best chair, still, still nosing for news. Then who appeared at the front door but Mrs. Elfie Wilcox in a hat. Mrs. Dowdle, I've come to set you with overnight and see our brave soldier through his last watch. In those days, people set up a corpse through the final night before burial. I'd have bet money wouldn't let Mom, Grandma wouldn't let Mrs. Wilcox in for a quick look, let alone overnight. But of course, Grandma was putting on the best show possible to pull the wool over the reporter's eyes. Little though she seemed to think of townspeople, she thought less of strangers. Grandma waved Mrs. Wilcox inside, and in she came, her eyes all over the place. She made for the coffin, stared at the blank white gauze, and said, Don't he look natural? Then she drew up a chair next to the reporter, and he flinched because he had it on good authority that she had been let out of an insane asylum. Warm, ain't it? She said, looking straight at him, but looking everywhere else. The crowd finally dispersed. Mary Alice and I hung at the edge of the room, too curious to be anywhere else. If you're here for the long haul, Grandma said to the reporter, how about a beer? He looked encouraged and Grandma left to him to Mrs. Wilcox, which meant, which she meant as punishment. <laughs> she came back with the three of her home brews, cellar cool. She brewed the beer to drink herself, but these three bottles were to see the reporter through the night. She wouldn't have expected her worst enemy, Effie Wilcox, to drink alcohol in front of a man. In normal circumstances, the family recalls stories about the departed to pass the long night hours, but these circumstances weren't normal, and quite a bit had already been recalled about Shotgun Cheatham anyway. Only a single lamp burned, and as the midnight drew on, the glads drooped in their pitchers. I was wedged in a corner beginning to do doze, and Mary Alice was soon asleep on a throw rug. After the second beer, the reporter lulled visions of shotgun Civil War glories, no doubt dancing in his head. You could hear the tick of the kitchen clock. Grandma's chin would droop, drop and then jerk back to Mrs. Wilcox. Mrs. Wil then jerk back. I'm sorry. These words are very tiny. Mrs. Wilcox had been humming Rock of Ages, but tapered off after Let Me Hide Myself in These. Then, after the quietest sound you ever heard, somewhere between a rustle and a whisper, it brought me around and I saw Grandma sit forward and cock her head. I blinked to make sure I was awake and the whole world seemed to listen. Not a leaf trembled outside, but the gauze that hung down on the open coffin moved and it twitched. Except for Mary Alice, we all saw it. The reporter sat bolt upright and Mrs. Wilcox made a little sound and then nothing. And then the gauze rippled as if a hand had passed across it from the other side, and in one place it wrinkled into a wad as if somebody had snagged it, as if a feeble hand had reached up from the coffin depths of one last desperate attempt to live before the dirt was shoveled in. Every hair on my head stood up. Nah, Mrs. Wilcox said, strangling. She pulled back into her chair and her head went forward, and her hat went forward. Nah. The reporter had his chair arms in a death grip. Sweet mother of, but grandma rocketed out of her chair. Whoa, shotgun, she bellowed. 
You've had your time, boy. You don't get no more. She galloped out of the room faster than I could believe. The reporter was re riveted and Mrs. Wilcox was sinking fast. Quicker than it takes to tell, Grandma was back and already raised her apron shoulder with the 12 gaze Winchester from behind the wood box. She was swinging it wildly around the room, skimming Mr. Wilcox's hair, and took aim at the gauze that draped the yawning coffin. And then she squeezed off around. I thought that sound would bring the house down around us. I couldn't hear right for a week. Grandma roared out, rest in peace, yo! And then she let fly with the other barrel. The reporter came out of the chair and whipped completely around in a circle. Beer bottles went everywhere and then straight route to the front door was in Grandma's line of fire and he didn't have the presence of mind to realize she'd already discharged both barrels. He went out a side window head first, leaving his hat and his notebook behind. What he feared more, the living or Grandma's aim, he didn't tarry to tell. Mrs. Wilcox was on her feet hollering, the dead is walking and Mrs. Dowell's gunning for me. She cut and ran out the front door and into the night. When the screen door snapped to behind her, silence fell. Mary Alice hadn't moved. The first explosion had blasted her awake, but she naturally thought that Grandma had killed her, so she didn't bother to budge. She says the whole experience gave her nightmares for years later. A burned powder haze hung in the room, cutting the smell of shotgun Cheetah. The white gaze was black rags now, and Grandma had blown the lid clear off of the coffin. She'd have blown out all of the windows in the bay, except that they were open. As it was, she pitted her woodwork bad and topped the snowball bushes outside. But apart from scattered shots, she hadn't disfigured Shotgun Cheatham any more than he already was. Grandma stood there savoring the silence, and then she turned towards the kitchen with her 12-gauge loose in her head. Time you kids went to bed, she said, as she trudged past us. Apart from Grandma herself, I was the only one who had seen that big old snaggletooth tomcat streak out of the coffin and over the windowsill when he, she lit fire. And I suppose she'd seen him climb in, which gave her the idea. It was the cat sitting snug on Shotgun Cheatham's breathless chest who batted at the gauze the way a cat will. And he sure lit out of the way he had come when Grandma fired just over his raggedy ears as he probably used up eight of his lives already. The cat in the coffin gave Grandma Dowdle her chance. She didn't seem to have any time for Effie Wilcox, whose tongue flapped at both ends. But she had even less for newspaper reporters who think your business is their business. Courtesy of the cat, she'd fired around, so to speak, in the direction of each. Though she didn't gloat, she looked satisfied. It certainly flashed out her reputation fleshed out her reputation and gave people new reason to leave her alone in peace. The story of Shotgun Cheatham's last night above ground kept the Coffee Pot Cafe fully engaged for the rest of our visit that summer. It was a story that grew in the telling in one of those little towns where there's always time to ponder all of the different kinds of truth. And that is the end of chapter one.